Check, check, check. I think I am. We got ya. How's it going so far? Your line has been insane today. How has it been meeting everybody so far? Oh, it's been good. I mean, uh, it's not overwhelming. It's, you know, and uh, when it slows down, you have a little time to talk to people, and when you don't, you move them through. <laughs> <laughs> that is very fair. So, we're going to start off with this. So, I love this. TV Guide included you in their list of the 60 nastiest villains of all time. And Rolling Stone ranked you on their list of 40 greatest TV villains of all time. So, Wayne, what makes you so nasty and so great? The secret to being a good villain is being scared inside. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that he's so much a villain as much as he is desperate. He's constantly desperate. Just let me have some of that, would you? You know, that's a bad thing. I, I don't know. Uh, it, it's so funny because really Newman didn't start out as a villain, but he did start out as a snitch. When it began, it was uh, the, an episode where the question was, um, how long do you have to wait to hit on somebody whose boyfriend is in a coma. Right. <laughs> that episode, that's where you first see Newman. No, and uh, so Newman and, and Kramer are friends of the guy in the coma, and they're in the hospital visiting that guy, and that's the first time you see them together. And when the writers saw the two of us together, it was like, you know, something from the 1939 World's Fair with a needle and a ball, you know, they said that. <laughs> so that, that's how it all began. And I was supposed to be the one who was snitching on Jerry about, you know, him using, uh, trying to date the girlfriend. And he bought me off with the Drake's cake. Now I work with Newman, I mean, I work with Kramer for a long time, and then finally, Michael says, you know what, I don't really want to be a two-act. I want to be able to be on my own. So they have to come up with another idea for Newman, and Newman becomes the nemesis to Jerry. And so that's the evolution of how he became the And obviously we learned a lot of life lessons from Seinfeld, but uh, most importantly, what do you think is the correct way to parallel park? Uh, I would say um, if you live in New York, you don't need a car. <laughs> That is, that is a true point. Uh, the parallel parking thing uh, is something that still perplexes me. <laughs> same here, same here. I, I've been driving all my life and I, I still, you know, I look at it as a challenge every time and when I do it correctly, I feel really proud of myself yeah. and I don't believe in the cars that do it for you. Oh, no. I'm against it. I'm against it. That's a firm stance. I appreciate that. Is that something you all have to do when you take your test here in Knoxville? Yeah. Like, do you guys parallel park here? No, yeah, either in Florida. Why well, don't we do parallel park in Knoxville? I mean, you should be able to find a place to park. That's so true. Uh, to pivot ever so slightly, so another one of your iconic roles, Third Rock from the Sun, right? Yeah. So you're referred to as a karaoke god, so I have to know what is your go-to karaoke song? You know, aside from um, Third Rock, I've never sung karaoke. <laughs> no. Night is young. No, <laughs> because uh, I can't remember the lyrics beyond the first verse. I'm like, hey, Baga, da 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 da. And I know it's on there, but then you gotta read and then read. Ah, no, no, it's not my thing. Okay, so no karaoke for you. That's no, right. but I, I, I will, uh, you know, sing some Tom Jones in my backyard for no apparent reason. I love that. Tom Jones, great peg. Uh, so, from what I was reading, also, did you initially work as a, a private detective? Not initially, but yes. I worked for five years as a private investigator after I was on Broadway. Uh, because the jobs that you know unemployed actors had were waiting tables, and I, I, I had a, another job, which was I sold uh, pound cakes and fruit cakes in Harlem. Uh, that I didn't, I didn't enjoy as much as I thought I would. I don't know why. And uh, I had a friend who was uh, a private investigator, you know, at, at this firm, and he's an actor. And I said, how the hell did you get that job? You don't have any criminology background or anything. He goes, no, they like hiring actors. I go, why? He goes, because they're not upwardly mobile. They, they usually want to get out for auditions. Uh, and uh, they have no scruples. <laughs> Perfectly willing to lie about themselves. So, yes, five years I worked as a private investigator in New York. Uh, and I'm right now, developing a script about that period of time. Because 
really it was about teaching actors how to be better liars. <laughs> hand in hand, kind of, Hesh. Well, since you did mention The Great White Way, I know you mentioned you were on Broadway, and I know you also did a production of Elf, where you were Santa Claus. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about Elf in general? Well, Elf was a, uh, you know, anytime you do a musical on, on Broadway is one of the greatest things in the world. And I never, when I started out in the business, you know, they told me you had to be a triple threat, you need to dance, you need to sing, you need to act, and I, I was a, like a minus two threat. I, I couldn't do any of that stuff. So, um, when, once I'd been on television, I got the opportunity to be in a, in a musical, to do a small thing in, in Sweet Charity, and I said, I've got to take this on, you know, so I did that. Once you've done one, people believe you can do the next, and so these things began to come up, and, uh, um, Elf was just a wonderful show because if you know the movie, it's just a wonderful movie. You know, I mean, it's just got an incredible amount of heart, and it's just. Uh, and my son, I was like three years old at the time, and he was able to come to the set, and I'm fully dressed in Santa regalia, and I've got a flying sleigh, and you know, yeah, pretty good. <laughs> Well, you mentioned being a triple threat, but sometimes you have to be a quadruple threat and know how to play basketball as well. Not me. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to know what it was like getting to be a member of the Toon Squad, and I also want to know, out of maybe all of your co-stars, who would you say would be the least athletic? I, 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 I think I am the least athletic of my co-stars, uh, <laughs> to be honest with you. I mean, one of the things that in Space Jam I made sure uh, not to do was touch a basketball. <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to be in the presence. You know, I mean, it's like you're in the presence of geniuses and you're trying to, you know, I just wanted to be the actor. And actually that worked out fine because they, I was respected as, oh, you're that funny guy, you're that actor. Because there weren't any others around. There were basketball players, cartoon characters, and we were acting in a, in a, like if this were all green, it's a green screen mm. studio where uh, people are wearing little ninja suits in green, and they're on their knees pretending to be cartoon characters. So um, that was considered my skill. <laughs> Whatever the hell that was. <laughs> Strangely, I never used that skill again. <laughs> but, uh, that's, it's remarkable. Uh, to pivot once again, I have to talk about one of my favorite films of all time, which is Jurassic Park. I wanted to know if, if Barbasol ever reached out to you to be a spokesman. <laughs> you know, that's why they went down. That's my favorite. Do you see a lot of Barbasol? No, now, just at conventions. You don't see Barbasol anywhere else. Uh, no, they didn't. <laughs> and I would have competed. I would have gone with Noxzema or any one of them, but no. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your time on set and maybe if you have a, a favorite or even a least favorite dinosaur? Oh, well, I mean, obviously, my least favorite is the one that, you know, does me in. Uh, <laughs> the Dilophosaurus. But uh, actually, my least favorite dinosaur is a person. Because uh, the guy who shot me in the face with black goop is named Rick Gallinson. And he lives across the street from me now. So he gets to hear you singing Tom Jones in the backyard. And he's, he's in my homeowners association. And it just drives me crazy. Because he had, uh, they first shot me with a, a uh, petroleum distillate, the one that's long distance. Then they shoot me in the shoulder with this stuff called methicil, which is alien goop. When you touch it, it stretches and goes for miles or whatever. And the third thing was he had a, a black uh, KY jelly in an air rifle standing about this far away from me. And he said, uh, I'm, you're going to turn away from camera, turn to, you're going to turn to camera to me. I'm going to be on this side of camera. I'm going to shoot you between the eyes. If you blink, we'll do it again. <laughs> did it twice. I almost got it out in the one, but I did it twice. And then, you splatted with, you know, with the stuff there. Ah, you can't blink. 
So uh, the next day, I, I'm, I'm working Seinfeld at the time. I went back to Seinfeld. Makeup artist said, Jesus, what is that? You've got a big purple stain on your face. <laughs> and so I, I went back to uh, Jurassic. I said, you know that stuff you used, it, it dyed my face purple. He said, yeah, it'll do that. <laughs> That's why he's such a friendly neighbor. <laughs> uh, so there is a quote going around, and you can tell me if you said this or not, but it said that your dream was to go skydiving. Is this something that you... Uh, I, actually, I, I think that's most of the people I'm on a plane with. Uh-huh, you <laughs> No, uh, uh, no I, I, have, I have entertained the idea, right. but you know, I, I, I wanted to lose enough weight and be young enough. I just missed it. <laughs> and I would say, you know, I mean, it was a little too heavy before, and now I'm a little too old. I think I'm going to let it, let it pass. We'll leave it to other but people. But flying, yeah. flying a single engine plane or, or, or skydiving, you know, I like roller coasters. I like, I like stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, it's one of those things that I think you need to do when you're, you know, just plenty stupid enough to do it. Yeah. And then later on, you go, oh, that was fun. Right. You know, but, it, but taking it on at this point, you know, I got a kid in school and insurance policies. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned roller coasters. Have you been down to Dollywood? I have, but I haven't been to Dollywood since. I mean, I was in Dollywood way back when. You know, when I was because I, I grew up in Georgia, uh, so I, I've been uh, to uh, Dollywood. We're Savannah. clapping for Georgia. That's cool. We can clap for Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Georgia. Cool. I'm a I'm a bulldog. I can't help it. There's nothing I can do about it. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to ask one more question, so if you guys want to line up with this microphone uh, after my question, we can start taking some from y'all. Um, so I wanted to know, let's see, oh, so obviously with a name like Wayne Knight, I feel like you were absolutely destined to voice a comic character, and I know you got to voice Penguin and Harley Quinn, and so I wanted to know, growing up, were you into comics and cartoons? Very, uh, very much so, and my, and my son is into into it very much now as well. He's 12. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I was a superhero fan. Uh, we had one comic book store in Cartersville, and uh, they had the superhero stuff was all on one thing, and, you know, I'd buy all the DCs, then I'd buy the Marvels, and then, like, over time, you know, when my father would go downtown. Back in those days, they were 12 cents. Uh, um, God almighty. But, um, yeah, so I, I've always been... Um, you know, sci-fi and, and, and comic books. Yeah. And those, so cons are perfect for me. I love, I love coming to them because, uh, you know, I, I secretly would like to buy the merch, but I go to the other end and sign things. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are happy to have you. All right, so we're going to start with the questions right over here. So what's your name and what's your question? My name is Bradley Kenobi. I met you earlier. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, I, I learned how to spell your name properly. You did, you did. <laughs> Um, so I was the opening team captain for the Velocicoaster at Universal Studios Orlando. I was there the moment we put the shovel in the ground. And I was curious, you said you like roller coasters. Have you ridden Velocicoaster yet? And have you ridden the River Adventure water ride at Universal Studios? No, I have not. And, and um, uh, anything that uh, monetizes Jurassic Park without paying me directly, I try to avoid. <laughs> <laughs> totally understand. Fair point. <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> What's your name? Hi, Wayne. My name is Brian. I'm a huge fan. I heard an anecdote, and I hope it's true, that Steven Spielberg considered you as the ideal, the first person to cast in Jurassic Park as Dennis Negri after yeah. watching you in the terrific performance in Basic Instinct. Yeah, I believe that that's what I've been told is true, but you know, what it means is that. I see this fat guy sweating and just imagine if he were a dinosaur instead of one who's open crotch, you know what I mean? It's an interesting way to cast, but uh, he's also such a good director that, you know, he just he figured he could take the raw material there and make something out of it, so it worked out. What a great performance, thank you. Thank you. What's your name? Uh, John. Hey, John. All right, so um, I, I remember back when I watched a YouTube video that, um, that uh, in the you saw that in the book Nedry's death was more gruesome yes. than how it was in the movie. Did, did you say that um, that you would have preferred Nedry to be killed off more like how they did in the book rather than they did in the movie? Well, I mean it's 
he got, I, I believe in the book, he was, uh, his head was crushed like a walnut. And his stomach slashed. Uh, and his stomach slashed. A noble death. <laughs> As opposed to having, you know, a, a, a quart-sized dinosaur hop on you, yeah. nah, 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 nah. maybe the crushing would be. Nah, nah, nah. Yeah. I mean, and to perform it would probably be, you know, miserable too. Though I don't know. So you know, either way is fine. I, I didn't anticipate a dinosaur death before doing the movie. So. Thank you. What's your name? My name is Joseph. Um, so in the episode of Seinfeld, the old man, when you are very much insulting the shop owner, did you and Michael ever get to like improvise or make any of the insults that you told him? Well, no, I mean, I was basically saying whatever I was told. Uh, and, and so we didn't know, we didn't... Uh, <laughs> the, the thing about um, a show run by Larry Charles, Larry, no, Larry David, Larry Charles was another writer. Larry Charles tried to run a show of mine. He was a writer on Seinfeld as well. But Larry David he, he was a uh, meticulous uh, writer. And Seinfeld is meticulous in terms of rhythms, that he listens to the rhythms of jokes and how they play out. And so if you do extraneous stuff or you trick, you don't know, no, because he's hearing it, you know, kind of like music. So over time, you've got to. Uh, you, know, you, you do it until you got it, and then if you want to try something else, you try something else at the end. But you don't pull it in the middle of the uh, thing. <laughs> Thank you. What's your name? Uh, my name is Brogan. Hey, I was going to ask, uh, how like soon on the set of uh, Jurassic Park did you know you were going to die? Oh, I, I, reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, ooh, I'm gonna die. <laughs> also, um, can you repeat the line, uh, no, uh, uh? You know, uh, I can. <laughs> For a Kruger band. Ah, ah, ah. Thank you. What's your name? My name is Jeremy. Um, yes, sir. I had you autograph a uh, print of mine from Buzz Lightyear of Star Command. And uh, I was wondering what it was like to play two Disney villains at the same time, because in addition to being Emperor Zerk, you were also Al in Toy Story 2. Could you? I know, and you know what kills me? It's like, no. and then Ratzenberger gets in all the films. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> you know, just bring the again. Uh, uh, I enjoyed uh, Zerg a lot because um, on, on, a, on a series, um, unlike a feature, you have a little more latitude and I was able to come up with things and improv things and then, you know, the, the vocal change to Zerg allows some of those things to be very funny. Yes. Uh, and we had a lot of fun doing, uh, doing Buzz Lightyear. I really enjoyed doing that show. Mm -hmm. And you were also uh, Tantor and Tarzan, so you did a lot of uh, animation, kind of back to back. Isn't that a funny coincidence? Well, I, I mean, I, I uh, have always enjoyed uh, animation, and I, I always think of it as like a, a very separate skill um, from like voice acting from regular acting in a way. You have to give yourself fully, and you do when you do a feature, you do the entire film, and then you come back and you record the entire film again. Mm -hmm. um, and my wife is a, uh, an editor and a director in animation. Um, so I've always like, appreciated it. And you know, uh, I really enjoy the idea of uh, the, the problem of being a celebrity in voice. Like if you get popular doing a TV show, oftentimes they'll cast you as a voice actor in something, wanting you to do what you do, you know, doing your past thing. And what I like doing is doing a character. If they let me play Tantor the Elephant, I'm going to play Tantor the Elephant. You know, I don't want to play me right. uh, doing that voice, which I've done. And I don't know how well that does for me or not, but uh, it's fun to do. You know, if you ever get a chance, when you're a kid and you're seeing Disney pictures and you think, imagine if I were one of those characters living on to other kids for the rest of time to be able to see that. 
That's pretty damn good. I enjoyed that very much. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. All right. What's your name? Hi, my name is Christian. Hi, Chris. And uh, growing up, the first film I ever saw you in was a film called Rat Race. Yes. And I wanted to ask, what was it like having basically all of your scenes with Rowan Atkinson? Like, what was that dynamic like? Rowan is a strange individual. <laughs> <laughs> he, is, he is rather sedate and somewhat right wing. And you wouldn't think of him as a wild, you know, kind of like this guy. And off camera, he isn't. And then, then the, we go action, and we're both insane. <laughs> you know, so uh, it was a, it was very interesting. It was like John Cleese and Rowan Atkinson, and you know, people that I never anticipated having uh, you know d doing a film with. So uh, the thing was that I was at that time trying to ratchet back my lunacy, thinking that I could be a more sedate actor, and the director was like, luckily whipping me. To go back to where I was, <laughs> to, to go back to the funny, um, but it was a it was a wild experience all over Canada. That's what the rat race was. <laughs> and then, uh, last and final question is just um, with your experience, your background, uh, with all the films that you've done already, is there something that you're wanting to accomplish, um, like instead of just being like a funny guy or? an emotion you want to carry over with the, with the new film you want him to do? Is there anything else like that in the future? Well, I, I mean, I would, I would enjoy playing somebody who's not uh, evil, <laughs> uh, but not too damn good. But I mean, interesting, you know. Um, I don't know, I mean, I, I think that the, uh, the idea is that you get pegged as certain kinds of characters and I, I just enjoy working and I enjoy embodying characters. And um, I never anticipated uh, waves going down and up and down the way they do. Because you go into season and out of season and other people are popular and so on and so forth. I, I just like to be in features and being able to be uh, regular characters in a, in a movie. I mean, some of the most fun I've had is just watching great actors work and uh, being directed by good directors and uh, being on a movie. So I don't, it's not about the specific role I want to fulfill. I just, uh, I'm very lucky to be doing this and I'm happy to be doing it. Thanks so much. Exactly. All right, we have time for these final four. What's your name? Hi, my name's Derek. Um, uh, we, we talked earlier, I mentioned that uh, I met Julie Brown out in LA. She yes. to say, say hello so that, that, that uh, based on that I wanted to ask you uh, and I did my part when the edge was on I watched it <laughs> uh, I, okay there was there was six of us but um, but uh, I just I just wondered if you had anything to say about that I mean she seemed really enthusiastic about uh, when she was talking about it she got really excited about well, you I mean, and about the show oh it's a wild show I mean what uh, people don't remember this show at all it was a sketch show on on Fox when Fox was just beginning, it wasn't even a network. Uh, the only sketch shows on the air at the time were The Edge, you know, Saturday Night Live, and In Living Color, In Living Color, which was on the same uh, network. Jennifer Aniston was in the show before Friends, uh, and Julie Brown, who was the kind of uh, MTV uh, Julie Brown, and uh, David Merkin, who was her boyfriend, was the showrunner producer. David Merkin later went on to uh, become the showrunner of The Simpsons for um, about maybe, I don't know, five to seven years. And every episode of The Edge, the cast got murdered at the end of the show. <laughs> so it's a sketch comedy, and at the end, he gets to kill the actors. And they die a gruesome and miserable death. And I thought, I don't know how this guy would be to work for. In the long term. Uh, but it was, a, it was a very funny uh, sketch comedy show. And it was, uh, you know, uh, back when the riots were happening in LA, we were shooting The Edge. And we were shooting it at CBS Radford where they shot Seinfeld. And uh, they were having a curfew because they were burning, of an, uh, of the city was burning down. And they were going to have a curfew at 7. So we worked until 6.55. <laughs> and then they won't let off. 
Those are my memories of the end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I don't know that you wanted this. <laughs> What's your name? John. Hey, John. Welcome to Knoxville. Thank you. Uh, just curious, you've got such an array of performances. I'm curious as to actors, actresses, directors, who are some of the favorites that you've been able to work with? And then also, have you had many, oh my God, I'm working with fill in the blank moments? Yeah, I mean, one of my first, the, the first thing I did is I did a sketch comedy show in England called Assaulted Nuts <laughs> with Emma Thompson. Uh, before she was Emma Thompson. And she uh, was a brilliant comedian and writer and just a kind of force of nature. And um, I worked with her again in the film Dead Again with Ken Branagh. Ken Branagh directed it. And I'm doing a scene with the British actor Derek Jacobi. And uh, there's Ken Branagh directing me. I'm working with Emma Thompson. And there's Derek Jacobi. And I'm like, what's wrong with this picture? Uh, <laughs> I didn't feel like I belonged in that circumstance at all. But, you know, that's the magic of, of doing this. And, and like on, on Jurassic Park, I got cast without meeting Spielberg. So when I, when I first met Spielberg, I flew to Hawaii. They drove me up a cane road in Kauai to the rainiest place on the planet, this place called Blue Hole. They also had all these trucks that were going to produce rain. And they had all this, this army of people there on mud, slogging through mud. And uh, I see something in the distance. It's the gates of Jurassic Park. And they drive me up to the base of the gate of Jurassic Park. Spielberg is at the base of it. And he's looking through a little vines. I get out and it's like, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Schweitzer, I presume. You know, I mean, I, I walked up to Spielberg and I said, I hope I'm the guy you wanted. And he said, you're the guy. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Okay. Right. Final two questions. What's your name? My name's Josh. Hey, Josh. Um, I was curious, what is your kind of philosophy on comedic performance, and do you think it translates better through stage or through film? I, I think it all comes down to the same basic idea, which is find the truth of what's going on. Magnify it. That's all you got to do. I mean, if you're scared, be very scared. If you're angry, be very angry. <laughs> you know, and, and then, uh, but be as honest as you can in doing it. And, and uh, if, what, what you're, if you're confused and you would, it would make you fall down, then you fall down. You know what I mean? You just take it to the place where it wants to go and then have a director say, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, the final question. Yeah. I mean, Laura, I actually was going to ask about the edge also. So I don't know if there's anything else you want to share from that time, like anything with Jennifer Aniston or any of well, the other. Well, there was a lot of up-and-comers at that time and with you, right? One thing about Jennifer is Jennifer was working on a show at the time as well as The Edge, called Muddling Through. And she was hoping desperately that it would be canceled <laughs> because uh, friends wanted her. And she couldn't do it because she was in Muddling Through. And Muddling Through at the last second got canceled, and that's where she went. So uh, at the time, doing that sketch show, you go, oh, that's interesting. Here's someone who's incredibly beautiful and funny. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Thank you for your question. I mean, that just proves everything happens for a reason, so yep. they're saying. So uh, before we do wrap this up, any thoughts you want to leave us with here today? No, just thank you uh, folks for coming out and, and the fact that, um, you know, I, I think that a lot of people don't start out doing conventions and, and meeting people. And then after you start meeting people, you know, you understand that it's a great thing to meet people because you've sustained my career. Thank you.